Hi everyone, Michael here, and I am joined by a friend of mine, Melissa Graham Burke. Melissa and I, we went to Tyndale together. Mm -hmm. I went on a track to become a pastor and she took the track to become a psychotherapist. She is a registered psychotherapist. And the reason that we are in this Zoom room together is because as I've been reflecting on Canada's tragic origins and really what's happened in the news uh, with the residential uh, schools and, and all of the findings and that have confirmed what Indigenous peoples in Canada have said for, for years now, I'm, I'm taken back and I'm feeling things that I haven't felt before and I'm thinking things that I haven't thought before. And what this sort of train of thought brought me to is how in the world am I going to talk to a future Liam or a future Maya about these difficult things? I want to be able to do that. It's so meaningful, but sometimes I don't feel like I have the tools mm -hmm. to have difficult conversations with a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old. So I wanted to pull in Melissa to get her expertise, to get her thoughts, because I imagine that I'm not alone, that there are many grandparents, that there are aunts, that there are uncles, that there are parents and caregivers who are thinking through this as well. So thank you, Melissa. And before we get into it, my question is, is this futile? Is this just vain? Can you mm -hmm. actually have difficult conversations with a six-year-old, with a seven-year-old, with an eight-year-old, or do we need to wait until they're older? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I think we need to start really young. And we need to start preparing our kids to understand so many complex things that they're gonna encounter throughout their life. So whether that's issues of body image or uh, confidence, friendships, all of these are really complex. When you start really deeply thinking about how do you build a healthy friendship? How do you feel good about your body? So even with those small things, we wanna start really early. And the same is true for really big topics like racism and oppression. Um, we want to be introducing in age appropriate ways some of these ideas um, from as old as you can begin to have a conversation. So you mentioned as old as you can begin to have a conversation. Uh, yes. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm young at, at being a parent. I'm new. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what that looks like. What is an age would you that you could say and that neurologists say that, yeah, you can have a conversation about deep, meaningful things that's not just, can you please put your shoes on? Can you please put your shoes on? Yeah, well, that's a, also an important conversation, putting your shoes on. But yes. I would say there are going to be pieces of any topic that we can start, I'd, you know, two or three years old. Kids are comprehending and observing, um, you know, research and, and science tells us that kids, infants are little sponges. They pick up tension. They pick up loving feelings. They're also picking up the things we're saying and they're trying to understand them. And maybe they can't express beyond, I'm throwing my shoe at you. Um, but we might interpret that as, oh, my child's upset about something. So their ability to take in ideas is gonna be different like the kind of way that they take in the idea is going to be different according to their age. But from very, very little, here's an, I'll give you an example. Consent. We're talking a lot about consent in our culture. This is a big idea. There's a lot of complexity here. And there are some darker, more difficult reasons why we want to talk about consent. But I'm not going to bring that to my two-year-old or my three-year-old. But I'm going to talk to them about, you know, would you like to go outside now? You know, mommy thinks it's time to go outside. What does your body tell you? Does your body tell you that you'd like to go outside too? Oh, well, let's put our shoes on so we can go outside. We can begin pieces of these conversations when they're really little. Oh, that's so good. I know a phrase that Teresa and I have been trying to work in is, are you ready yet? To, yeah. to get that idea of, yeah, what are you feeling, Liam? What, what are you thinking? Mm -hmm. where, where are you on the emotional bandwagon? Uh, and, and how does that help you in this current state? So can we play scenario? Because this mm -hmm. is scenario has, has run through my mind quite a bit. Liam comes home from grade one and he hits uh, Canadian history. Mm -hmm. And he, we open up the textbook and we're reading through it. And the textbook is not as clear 
as I would like it to be regarding residential schools, regarding yeah. Canada, uh, Canada's history. Yeah. How do I begin to, ha to have a chat with Liam in the grade one language about all, all that we've learned up until this point and probably are going to continue to learn, unfortunately? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I think we have to start with, like, Mike, I think you even anticipating that question coming is the very first step. Uh, as parent, I'm a parent as well. I've got a six-year-old and eight-year-old. They're almost seven and nine now, big kids. Um, and I need to anticipate that there are conversations coming that are going to be important. Um, you know, when we start talking about bodies and puberty, I'm going to need to be ready for those. I know that in the Canadian, you know, education system, thankfully, we are now learning more and more about residential schools. Um, that information and that education is happening in schools. So if I know I'm feeling a little bit nervous or uncertain about how to have that conversation in the best way possible, then my very first step before anything is preparing myself. What research do I need to do? Um, as a settler, what do I need to educate myself in before I feel ready to start sharing that with my children? Um, I always recommend finding really good children's books on these topics. And there are so many, there's amazing indigenous writers who have created beautiful stories for children. Sometimes teachers already have these resources. You can ask them which books they're reading in the class when they learn about residential schools. There are some wonderful bookstores all over the place. One I highly recommend is called Another Story Bookstore. Uh, in downtown Toronto, but they have a great online store and they do an amazing job if you call them up and say, hey, I'm looking for this resource. So get yourself ready, get yourself filled with that knowledge as much as you can. And I think that also means anticipating what parts might feel uncomfortable or awkward for you. Because we want to feel confident and equipped to have those conversations and we want to be able to put that awkwardness or discomfort behind us or acknowledge that it's there as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So before my child comes home with this question that they've raised from school, I wanna try and be as prepared as possible for myself. Then I'm probably going to stumble and make some mistakes or say the wrong thing or confuse them, but I have some resources in my mind that I can bring to the conversation and maybe even a story we can read together. Mm -hmm. So that's some preparation idea. I can continue here, but if you want to, do you have any questions about that, Mike? I love that. And uh, I want us to come back to it later, but just to have in the back of your mind, you, you talked about stumbling through things. And yes. I know, again, as, as a new parent, I'm just beginning to think through how to have these conversations. And sometimes when I, and they don't go very well, mm -hmm. even when it becomes behavioral, you're like, oh boy, and you want to shrink yeah. back. And so being able to name the fact that you're probably going to stumble, no, no one's an expert, but bringing in that team mentality uh, to, to your approach so that you don't feel like you need to carry the burden uh, all yourself, because that's fantastic, right? When it comes to physical health, we don't just got one guy or one girl. Like we have this team of specialists, these people that can come around, around us to help us. So yeah, I thank you. I just wanted to hone in that, highlight that. But continue on. I'm loving where this scenario is going. I'm feeling encouraged all the more. Yeah. So uh, the, the next thing to think about is to, to know that the way that children ask questions is often based on like the here and now moment. So as adults, we have a lot of complex thoughts. We can go backwards in time. We can go forwards in time. We have a really developed prefrontal cortex, the really like rational thinking part of our mind. And our children are still developing that. So if I start trying to explain something, residential schools, well, I'm going back into history and I'm talking about well, schools and there's a history of these kinds of schools and well, they come from um, the government and my child is stopped here because I've just said the word government. They might not know what that means. So if I'm stumbling and getting frustrated with myself because the words aren't coming out, my, my child is probably also a bit confused. So we wanna remember that um, little pieces 
and giving time for those little pieces to be shared and digested um, is the best way. So this isn't a single conversation. This is a lifetime of conversations that change in complexity. But with little kids, it's going to be weeks, uh, maybe even months or several years of them really starting to try and understand racism, oppression, and the history of the residential schools. It's helpful to remember that they don't have all the questions at once. They're going to have a couple questions, and I want to go with those questions that seem in the moment, as I said, really important to them right now. So one of the big ways that we can hone into those in the moments is just asking them questions. Well, what did your teacher say about it in school? I, I want to really hear about that and see what they remember. Um, if they do remember something, ask them more, what did you think about that? What were your ideas about that idea that the teacher shared for you? So you really want to hone in on what are their questions and to go with answers that work in that here and now moment of what they're curious about. So if I start going on to a history lesson, their attention span might have dropped off or I'm answering questions that they're not asking yet and that they're confused by. And so now I'm just kind of lecturing at them and, and they're getting bored. Mm -hmm. So we're taking little pieces of information. We're working here and now to answer the questions that they have. And if we notice that they're capturing that and they're excited, you know, like, oh, I didn't think of that, or they want to understand more, then I can move them towards a little bit more information, mm -hmm. a little more complexity. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that's really good. I, and I think what it does is it allows me to be more present of being a parent than someone who's just communicating information. Mm -hmm. because we obviously, we will know our kids the best and mm -hmm. we can meet them at whatever emotional level they're at, whatever intellectual development level that they're at. And we can, we can go from there. So that's, that's really great. Continue on. This is, okay. this is incredible. Okay. So the next piece I think, and this is where we have to work on something for ourselves is that we need to trust our children and we need to trust that they can handle and understand difficult things. So once I start asking those questions and they start responding and we start talking, now maybe we're getting into some of the painful pieces of this story, some of the uncomfortable pieces where our own discomfort or pain or hurt or sadness might be coming out. And so we need to trust our children to be able to hold on to the emotion of the moment too. So if I find myself getting choked up as I describe something that they have a question about, I don't want to hide that from them. I'm going to share, yeah, you know, this makes mommy feel really sad too, that this happened to children in our country. And I want to provide empathy and support. And I don't want to pretend like this is a lecture and I'm talking about history, but that I'm talking about a very real and terrible thing and that there's emotions in that too. So we wanna trust our children that they can understand the feelings part of this, that it, there's a feeling that comes with the information, uh, not just facts or history, that our feelings about it and their feelings are important. And sometimes that's where we wanna stay. We've shared a little bit of information and we're talking about how we feel about that information. And maybe that's where we, leave it for the time being. Let them sit with how they feel about it and be open to any questions they might come at you later. So I don't know if you've ever noticed this, like with Liam, that you might talk about something like two weeks earlier and then suddenly out of the blue, it's like, so how do the cows have seven stomachs? Like, where are they inside? Like. This little question has been in your kid's head for weeks. Mm -hmm. They're maybe not expressing it, but it comes out later. Mm -hmm. I find with my kids, this often happens at bedtime. We're quiet, we're relaxed, it's the end of the day. It's a really kind of intimate, cozy time. And my kids will be like, well, you know, I was thinking about that thing we talked about, about residential schools. And 
I had a question about it. And that's a great time to pick up the conversation again. This is kind of what I mean about it. It's never over. It's always yeah. going to come back. So we want to give them the space to sit with their questions too. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's so good. And, and talking about stories, when Liam was probably a year and a half, I accidentally broke his shovel. Uh, and let me tell you. You heard about that. Oh, I heard about it. It was ingrained. And he told everybody that I broke his blue shovel. So I am very aware of, of how lingering effects mm -hmm. take place in, in children. And, and if I could pull again, what pinged for me yeah. was the fact that in conversations, if we come with an agenda and like a timeline, I think we're setting ourselves up for failure. But as you're describing it, if we allow ourselves to be available to their timeline as they're processing mm -hmm. through, we're setting ourselves and them up for, I think, a much more fruitful conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of pattern, um, behavior, relationship that we want to establish with our kids young. And that's why I think there's no too young age to begin these conversations. Mm. Because when my kids are 12, 13, 16, 17, I want them to know that they can come to me with any question that they have about anything at any time, except for maybe like 2 a.m. But although maybe, yeah, maybe I will answer questions at 2 a.m. So if I allow them to come to me now and, and I have patience and time and energy to sit and get still and quiet and have more conversations about it, that makes me a person that they come to who's safe to answer questions for them. And so that means that regardless of the issue, regardless of the stress or the worry they have or the big topics, the hard conversations that they're having at school, the history they're learning, they're always gonna know that I'm available to them to keep answering those questions. And as they get older, they become dialogues and they come debates or things we research together, but we start that off when they're really little. Yeah. Oh, this is, this is so good. Can I run one more scenario by sure, you? Yeah, let's and, hear it. And it's not necessarily a full blown scenario like this, but I'm sure many parents have in the back of their mind, like what if our kid is the person with the bad idea right? Mm -hmm. We, we always want our kid to be mm -hmm. this like activist, yeah. to be this person who comes in and is able to create a culture of empathy. But the reality is that might not be the case. They might pick up a bad idea. So let's say they share a bad idea about indigenous people, yeah. or um, I, I'm thinking of some of the conversations that I've had with other parents who about race and, and mm -hmm. their kid says some words that are, are not appropriate. Yeah. How do we, in a loving way, obviously check ourselves to make sure we're not just moving out of insecurity, but then approach a conversation like that? Yeah, I think kids experiment a lot with something they hear. Um, sometimes they like to test boundaries as well. You know, they do that in all kinds of things, what they're going to eat, what they're going to, when they're going to go to sleep. Um, and they'll do that as they get older with more complex things as well. So my approach first is always to be non-shaming. Mm -hmm. I don't want to respond by, oh, I can't believe you said that. We never say that word. That might be our instinct because it's how we feel. But I want to try and with as much ability as possible in that moment to be present with myself enough to say, okay, let's talk about that word. And I don't want to shame my child for having said it, because they might not quite understand that that idea is not, um, you know, that that, that could be a offensive or derogatory word, or that that idea is maybe moving away from the values that we hold as a family or as a community. Mm -hmm. So I don't want them to feel ashamed for having said that. So with openness, with receptivity to where that word or that thought came from, I'm going to just, again, go back to my questions. Oh, you know, where did you hear that word? Or what do you think that word might mean? And we start talking about it and getting into gently without shame, why that word or that idea might hurt other people. And the thing that I go back to, and I think this is also maybe like a, a way of approaching any of these topics is to always go back to big ideas. 
So an example being uh, my daughter and I had a conversation about Barbie dolls. All my childhood Barbie dolls are up at my mom's house. And whenever we go there, she's always excited to play with them. But we've had some conversations about how Barbie's body is a bit funny and too tall and too skinny and a little stiff. Um, and I always link it back to some big ideas. So I'll say something like, there are some ideas that live in our world that have an influence or they have a power over what we do and what we think. And one of the big ideas in the world is that women should be skinny. And this big idea is everywhere. We hear it uh, in movies and on TV. We see it in advertisements. But does everybody's body look like that? No. Bodies are all very different. But this big idea influences, gets into even what dolls look like. Mm -hmm. So now my child has an idea that this is a thing that influences lots. So when we're thinking about residential schools, we can say the same thing about racism, that there are ideas in the world that exist, that float around. I don't have to get into all the reasons why those ideas are there yet. That's a complex idea that great fruitful conversations. But if we stick with starting with the idea that some people are better than other people and that that idea gets into how people are treated. And some people are treated better than other people. And this idea hurts people. And this idea is wrong. And that's a really simple way of breaking down where we get to something like why residential schools happened mm -hmm. and what they were doing. I don't have to share all the details for them to grasp that idea, that this big idea influences how people treat each other and it hurts people. I think I got a little off track and distracted there, but that's, yeah, that's that so big good. Point I wanted to make. <laughs> that is so good. I am. I want to give you opportunity to speak to any other tools that you have, mm -hmm. um, but I think maybe in terms of a, a wrap up of yeah. where my mind is, I know that parenting is hard because it's so significant. Mm -hmm. And so for maybe some parents who are feeling a little bit overwhelmed right now, having these conversations, because we're not trained psychotherapists, maybe speak to us a little bit. Um, but certainly, so first, the tools, if you have any more, and then speak, speak to us uh, common folk about how to do this well. I think it's just making the commitment to do it. And to keep showing up. Even when you mess it up. If you notice that you're having a hard time getting the language, that's when you keep doing your research. That's where you keep ordering children's books. Um, we keep showing up to have these conversations, even though they're difficult and hard, and sometimes we get it wrong. Our kids watching us stumble through it actually teaches them an incredible lesson, because we're going to do this with all kinds of parts of parenting. It's a difficult, endless job that none of us have ever done before. So if we can stumble with integrity and with a heart uh, of empathy and a desire for understanding, and we keep stumbling, our kids are watching us figure it out. And what, what are they learning? They're learning how to do it too. They're learning that when mom doesn't know the answer, she goes and gets a book and she keeps learning. And then we talk about it again. Mm -hmm. And it's that showing up and trying and stumbling and resourcing ourselves um, that the more we do, the clearer the conversations become and the more grace we can have with ourselves um, because we can know that the stumbling process is also important. Oh, thank you, Melissa. And as we talked about earlier, it's so important to have a team. It's mm -hmm. important to have teams when we talk about resources and literature, we talk about maybe even parenting groups or a mm -hmm. team approach is really, really mm -hmm. great. And I know that you are in many people's teams as a psychotherapist. And so can you share a little bit about your practice? I would love to learn more. 
Sure. Um, and also one more note on resources before I do that. Yeah. Um, one of the most important things in equipping ourselves for these conversations is looking for indigenous resources and educating ourselves, um, but also not relying on indigenous people to do that education for us. So um, that can mean finding books, um, finding parent parenting groups, all of those sorts of things. And sometimes it might mean your own processing um, and understanding for yourselves. Um, this kind of stuff, you know, getting conversations going. Um, so in terms of me, um, I do work in uh, a couple of different settings as a therapist. Um, I have my own private practice and I also work with a community counseling agency. A lot of my work is with um, parents and working mothers, um, navigating all kinds of the difficulties of the workplace um, for moms who work. Um, and sort of the other side of my work is working a lot with men, uh, masculinity and domestic violence. So it's a bit of a smattering of things, um, but primarily working from the private practice of just seeing clients and talking about uh, some of those particular issues, but lots of general things too. Amazing. And thank you again for this, uh, for this time. One of the things I, I so appreciate with, about you is that you are able to sit with people from a medley of different life experiences. Uh, and I saw that in our time together at Tyndale. Uh, and then you see that as life has led you almost to kind of polar opposites. So uh, continue doing the amazing work and thank you for your time right now. We'll put a, a link to your private practice and some of the resources in the description right below this video. Thanks everyone for starting the conversation with us and then continuing it with other trusted people that you love and who are in your corner. Have a great day.